Hello, and welcome to Book Break for Greece Public Library. I am Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here, and I moderate our Pints and Prose book discussion group. And I am joined, as always, by my fellow reader, Claire. Hi, everyone. I'm Claire. I moderate As the Page Turns at the library and also our historical group on Facebook. And And today, we have a special guest with us. Welcome, Lydia. Hello. Uh, My name is Lydia. I'm a desk aide Mm -hmm. at Greece. Which means you all may have seen her helping you to check out your books or return things. And we are so pleased to have you with us today, Lydia. Um, Do you want to tell us a little bit about what kinds of things you like to read? Sure. I tend to read... Not weird brag, but like (laughs) 200 or so books a year. um, Oh, bless. A bunch of it. It splits pretty evenly between nonfiction. I like to read about film and Hollywood history and also kind of like genre fiction, Mm -hmm. YA, sci-fi, um, crime, crime novels. <laughs> Excellent. Well, you, you fit in right good in. company there. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Kirsten and I love murder. We yes. love, you know, <laughs> love a good murdery book. <laughs> oh. Awesome. 200. That is really impressive. That is impressive. So. Um, a lot of it's audiobooks. I love a good audiobook word. as well. Yes. Absolutely. I found that I have been able to expand my reach with audio as well. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Well, we are going to go around. We don't have a true theme today, um, although I did pick some Halloween adjacent books for myself because I love Halloween. Um, And yeah, we can go ahead and get started. Lydia, would you like to go first or last? Uh, I will go first, Awesome. I guess. I'll just leap right in. Definitely. Um, So the first book I brought for the roundup is one of those genre-y science fiction ones. It's The Memory Police by Yoko Ogawa. It's a Japanese novel that was first written in 1994, but it did not get an English translation until uh, 2019. Okay. And I don't mm, don't know if I would call it sci-fi or speculative fiction. The plot is it's about a small island probably off the coast of japan and the inhabitants there experience this weird phenomenon where one day they will forget something and then it's just like the concept does not exist anymore Mm -hmm. the mechanism for how this works is not really explained but people aren't bothered by it um it doesn't start to affect life in big ways at first it's things like the concept of a ribbon and then nobody knows what a ribbon is Hmm. Um, but for some people in this island population it doesn't work the process and that's where you have the idea of the memory police have started to come in and crack down on the individuals okay. that are not forgetting properly. Oh, okay. Um, and so it's a really uh, creepy, interesting concept. It, the the title if kind of evokes 1984 mm-hmm. and the thought police. And the main character is a woman who it works on, but mm-hmm. she's a novelist. And her editor, who she's got a good relationship with, is one of the people that it doesn't work on. And so it's kind of how she is navigating the way things change slowly and then eventually when crackdowns start happening and she kind of like takes her editor in to, mm. s- to, to keep him safe from the memory police. Um, and I really liked it. I, there's two things I really liked about it. One is the novels that the novelist is writing. They get excerpted in the text. So you'll have nice. plot text and then mm-hmm. some of the fiction that the novelist writes. And you kind of see how she totally incorporates like telling original creative stories while forgetting things like important mm-hmm. concepts. And I overall kind of loved just the whole tone of it. It's like very melancholy. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't really have a happy ending, and you might can guess, but I think it just does a really, really wonderful job of showing, like, what people can put up with and, like, how they adapt to, like, really authoritarian, maybe, mm-hmm. conditions, mm-hmm. and it felt really, really modern, even though it's a 1994 mm-hmm. book. The translation was new, which is how I read it, mm-hmm. but yeah, I highly recommend The Memory Police. Nice. Sounds really interesting. Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, 
Have you read the book of M? No. Okay. So there are, it sounds like a, some slight parallels. Um, I think I talked about that one a hundred years ago on book break. Um, but that one, there's a phenomenon where people lose their shadows Mm. and then they start forgetting things, but it's the same kind of, um, almost, well, that book takes it to almost like a magic realism Mm. place. Um, but I'd be, I'd be interested to discuss that one with you if you read that one. But I'm, I'm going to put yours on my list. I think that sounds really good. Yeah, that does sound good. Nice. I'm kind of in the same vein or something similar. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to jump in and go mm-hmm. next. But yeah, yeah, yeah. this is one I read as an advanced copy, and I'm glad I finally can talk about it. <laughs> it's Celeste Ng, Our Missing Hearts. So this one is, if you've read her before, she wrote... Little Fires Everywhere. Little Fires Everywhere and And Everything I Never Told You. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a big deviation from those. She goes in a really different direction. So I'm going to give you like the lowdown. 12-year-old Bird Gardner lives in a quiet existence with his loving but very broken father who was a former linguist but now shelves books at the Harvard University Library. Bird knows not to ask too many questions, not to stand out too much, stray too far. For a decade, their lives have been pretty much governed by um, a new law that is preserving American culture Mm -hmm. in the wake of a huge economic crash. So it's kind of got a Mm -hmm. semi-dystopian ring to it, but... Also, also feeling kind of like oh this is gonna accurate yeah in yeah, some way this is gonna happen yeah, okay. which is really what <laughs> you know is so unnerving about it sure so to keep the peace and restore prosperity author uh, restore prosperity um, the authorities are now relocating children of dissidents um, especially those of Asian origin. And mm-hmm. libraries have been forced to remove books that are seen as unpatriotic including the work of Bird's mother, who was a Chinese-American poet Hmm. and mysteriously left the family when Bird was only nine years old. So this is how the story starts. So he's grown up like pretty much disavowing his mother, not knowing about it. His father clamps down, is very reluctant to answer any questions about his mother. But he receives a mysterious letter that contains a very cryptic drawing of cats, which kind of jogs something in his memory. And he remembers folk tales and books that his mother read to him. And so he begins this kind of treasure hunt, which he wants to eventually find his mother. Um, So it takes him to New York City. And I don't want to give too much away, but this is a story very much, it kind of reminded me a bit of, um, oh gosh, I can't think, the one that we love so much, the... <laughs> the Station Eleven? Yes, yes, kind of Station Eleven <laughs> vibes in that it, it talks a lot about how art can be used to send out a message. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it really, the thing that really got me about this one is I believe that um, the author started writing it when like Asian American hate crimes started Mm -hmm. spiking up so she kind of wove that into the fabric of the story but put it in this dystopian world but it it was you know sometimes I think you can enjoy a dystopian novel a little bit more because it feels so far removed Mm. but this one didn't feel very removed to me Mm -hmm. Um, It really kind of had McCarthyism things, but, you know, working in libraries, we've seen articles about how a lot of books are being challenged, you know, people are Mm -hmm. losing their jobs for refusing to remove said books, Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, basically in this book, the the crisis was blamed on China. You know, that's where, no matter if that happened or not, but that's where all the, you know, blame was place so anyone of asian origin faced severe repercussions Mm -hmm. in the story so it um 
you know, particularly the people that they removed the children and placed them in what they called more fit homes. Mm -hmm. And Bird is friends with one of these, like a student like that who has been moved and then disappears again. So he has that mystery to kind of solve too. So, um, yeah. So between today's political happenings and everything else, that's the only thing, like, I thought it was very good. I thought it was very well written. I'm not sure I really liked how it ended. I'm not sure I can really tell you it ended like, yay, it's happy. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't. So, um, but it was interesting. And mm -hmm. I think it would make a great book club choice because there's a lot of different plot lines to investigate. But it is not like her previous work, um, especially, I would say, Little Fires Everywhere, which is very mainstream. I mm -hmm. believe it was purchased by... It's a Hulu miniseries. Yes. Yeah. Um, but this one was is Reese Witherspoon's book club um, for this month. So, yeah, Little Fires, not Little Fires Everywhere, <laughs> Our Missing Hearts. I'm, I'm doing great today. <laughs> you can tell I've been on vacation, people, <laughs> trying to get back into the swing of things. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, that one sounds really good too. It sounds like a good double, double bill. Yeah, with mm -hmm. mine. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. they yours and my <laughs> books have a lot of similar little similar. nuances mm -hmm. and themes, especially so. like Asian culture and yeah. mm -hmm. creeping, right? Fascism, yes. maybe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, yeah, definitely. Little fascism thrown in for fun. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, now I'm going to take us in a completely different direction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so like I said, it's, um, it's my, it's spooky season for me. Um, so my first book, um, which has just an amazing cover is Just Like Home by Sarah Gailey. Uh, so this one, um, it, it starts out, you think that it's one kind of book. And then it kind of starts to turn into a different kind of book. And then by the end, it's something completely different. Um, so you've got to just go along for the ride. So our main character in the story is Vera Crowder. She is in her um, late 20s. She's kind of aimless and not doing particularly well in her life. Um, and she gets a call from her mother, Daphne, that Daphne is dying and Vera needs to come home and kind of figure out what to do with the house. So even though we know immediately that Vera and Daphne have been basically completely estranged for the last 18 years, uh, Vera goes home, shows up back at the Crowder house, and um, we start to figure out very quickly that something terrible has happened in this house in the past like for instance they call it always the Crowder house and Vera talks about how um, once people put together her name with her history things tend to go sour Ooh. she ends up moving around a lot um, and this all seems to have something to do with her father Francis Crowder um, who is deceased at this point in the story so at first, it feels like you're walking into kind of a thriller mm -hmm. with maybe some like spooky elements, but kind of just like your standard thriller, like what has happened? What's the secret about Francis? What really happened in the Crowder house? Um, and then, then things start to get weirder <laughs> and creepier. <laughs> um, so... Living in the shed behind the house is James Duvall. He's an artist, um, and he is paying to stay in the shed of the Crowder house while he lets the Crowder house, like, inspire his art. And we get the sense that this has happened a fair amount. This is kind of how Daphne is making ends meet. Um, and the whole house has turned into 
kind of a shrine to Francis. So like plexiglass screwed down on top of carpets and tables so that everything is maintained exactly as it was when Francis was there. The face that you're making, Claire, is like the face my brain was making through most of this book in the best possible way. I don't I don't like scary things. Leah. I know you don't. I know you don't. So I may just plug my ears now. And, um, and then once again, it gets even creepier and even weirder. So I don't want to spoil how the story changes. I don't want to spoil where the creepy comes in, but this is definitely a work of horror. So if you are not a fan of horror, give this one a miss. Um, But this is kind of part thriller, part ghost story, part um, gothic. Okay. Like it's, blends a lot of different genres together and comes up with something very original. And you liked it. You, I did. It yeah. was it was a slow burn through about the first half of it, but the last half I was like, "Oh my god. Where is it going? Oh my god." <laughs> Um, through lots of twists and turns. Okay. So I ended up very much enjoying it. Oh, good. I thought it was great. It is, sounds like a perfect read for this time of year. Is Sarah Gailey the Magic for Liars author? I believe so. Also, um, The Echo Wife. Yeah. Yes. So she's a really good genre grasp. Mm-hmm. That sounds right up my alley and perfect for this time of year. And the cover, once again, <laughs> I'm just showing the, yeah. the cover is fantastic and very um, apropos. So I'll leave you with that. I think the Echo Wife was on some list for Ooh. like people that want sci-fi light, but like mix it up with other genres. So I had that one on my list. Not that one. <laughs> the Echo, the Echo I would Wife. be. Sh- I would have told you, Claire. You don't. Yeah. I don't think you want to read this book. I feel like the cover would give that one away. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's a great cover though. Mm-hmm. So yeah, sucker for a good cover. Yeah. Yeah. What you got next for us? This one is also a completely different direction. So Perfect. the other half of the type of stuff that I like to read, I brought a nonfiction book. And I listened to this one on audio, so I recommend that version. It's Bitter Brew by William Nodelsider. And the subtitle is um, The Rise and Fall of Anheuser-Busch and America's Kings of Beer. Nice. And it hmm. is the saga of Anheuser-Busch, who produces Budweiser. I don't know if you know this, but Budweiser is actually not an American brand anymore. It was acquired by a Brazilian-Belgium conglomerate called InBev in 2008. And this is not a spoiler. The book opens with this, like, disastrous conference that's, like, the downhill of (laughs) Budweiser Bush family. But I, <laughs> I love this book because it is a, it covers five generations of the Bushes, starting like pre Civil War, and sh- shepherding the brand through both World War One with a lot of anti German mm-hmm. sentiment was in America, and then through Prohibition, like producing near beer and all these other products that kept the company afloat, and then they sent the Clydesdales team to the White House with a ice cold thing of Bud for <laughs> FDR <laughs> at the end. Perfect. <laughs> and, and then you have the rest of the family. And it's truly this like uh, American tragedy saga of like fathers staying on too long as the CEO mm. and then like promoting their first sons who may or may not not uh, <laughs> be <laughs> be be um, qualified, let's say, to head mm-hmm. such a huge company. And there's also, like, kidnappings and, like, really tragic shootings and, like, family infighting and union busting. And the Cardinals are in there. Oh, wow. (laughs) So, like, sports history, like, kind of coincides. And I... It's really well written and really engaging. The whole time I was listening to it, I was kind of like fan casting a television show. I think this could mm. be a really good like succession or something. Nice, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I would recommend Bitter Brew. Just and you don't have to be a beer fan or anything like that. It's just really engaging family saga. That's true. <laughs> 
That sounds really good. It does. And, you know, Budweiser doesn't maybe have a good reputation today, but I say the best beer I've ever had is you go to their factory in St. Louis Mm -hmm. and you get a fresh one from their beer garden at the end of the tour and it'll change your mind. (laughs) I will bear that in mind if I'm ever in St. Louis. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Very cool. I love a good nonfiction. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it's on Hoopla. Which you can do Perfect. through our library. Oh wow, Perfect. That, that's awesome! I might have to add, <laughs> cue that up because I love I love using Hoopla now in audiobooks mm-hmm. as I walk. So, so yeah, and it'll, you'll keep wanting to listen. Your walks will get longer, right? <laughs> you're like, what are what are these people up and to? And I need that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. My next one is one of my book of the month picks, and it is Sarah Addison Allen. It's called Other Birds, and I thought this would be be a great one to talk about in October because it's um, a lot of magical realism. Mm. She always has elements of magical realism in her books, and she has not written in a while. So I think it was like a good eight years or something oh, wow. from her last novel. Um, so this one... It is set off the coast of South Carolina. It's a small island called Mallow Island, and they have little birds there, little blue birds, which, of course, Claire loves. Um, They're called um, (laughs) Delawisps, and that's what the the hotel is called, too, or the little, very small apartment complex. So it's a stunning old cobblestone building shaped like a horseshoe and named after the tiny turquoise birds who alongside its humans tenants er, inhabit a mare an air of magical secrecy so we have a young woman her name is zoe and her mother has passed away and this apartment has been held in trust for her until she gets to be a certain age so she has come to claim her deceased mother's apartment and she's starting to meet all her neighbors of course are very quirky secretive um so there's a young woman with a past two estranged middle-aged sisters uh, a lonely chef and uh, multiple ghosts so one of the older sisters dies and Zoe is hired by the apartment tenant manager to go through her apartment and help clean it out for the next tenant. And the woman was a hoarder, so this is quite a job. Um, yeah, so each of these people have a different story. You know that along the line somewhere, of course, the woman that died has a, a son who wants nothing to do with her. He is on the West Coast. You know, they're trying to contact him. So will he come back? You know, will he fall in love with Zoe? You know, (laughs) Zoe's a student. Spoiler Um, alert, Claire. Spoiler alert. (laughs) Spoiler alert. So, but it's it's just really it was good because she needs to heal from her own mother's passing. Her father had remarried, so once again, she doesn't know a lot about her own personal history. So she was kind of hoping to come here to learn more about who her mother really was. Um, and there's also like a local author who is very mysterious that comes into the story. So it's just a lot of fun, quirky characters. It was kind of a palate cleanser if you've Mm. been reading a lot of heavy things. Um, you know, and there's some happiness that comes in and of course it ends hopefully, which is good. So the ghosts are happy. The people are happy. Everyone's happy. Excellent. Yeah. But it was a fun October read for someone who doesn't like horror. (laughs) It's the lighter side of spooky season. The lighter side of spooky season, yeah. Do you often have good luck with book of the month picks? Because I found that they've got like family themes. I tried it for a little while and it was a little hit or miss for me. Yeah, I've done pretty well with it. And my daughter and I usually try to pick one that we read together. um, And then, you know, other things. So they are heavy on certain themes. Like they don't have a lot. People complain. Like I'm on a Reddit board for Book of the Month Club and <laughs> why is there no fantasy or serious sci fi? And, you know, so yeah, there's a lot of complaints. But on the whole, it's fun. The only thing keeping me from trying Book of the Month Club is the visualization of the just pile of books that's going to stack up in my house and then the divorce papers that I'm going to get served. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
But I am jealous that you always have like your finger on the pulse of the brand new books. Yeah. Yeah. It is fun for that reason. So, yeah. All right. Well, my last book is not a brand new book. My last book is quite old. I have to- let me actually take a look. 2003. So it's almost 20 years old, but it is Stiff by Mary Roach, subtitle The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers. So this is my nonfiction pick. It is, uh, I don't know, vaguely Halloween y related because it's about dead people. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was great. I loved it. It's the first Mary Roach that I've read. Um, and I'm not sure why it's taken me this long to find her, but um, I really enjoyed it. So this is just as it says, it's an entire book about what happens to our bodies after we die. Um, so it ranges from the historical. So she talks about like body snatching in earlier centuries and the use of cadavers in medical research and medical education. Um crash testing did you know did you know that car companies have used human bodies for crash testing i did not know that because sometimes uh oh we've been sitting still too long and our lights went out (laughs) um all right and sean says it doesn't look too bad so we're just gonna keep going there we go um so yeah so they would literally strap cadavers into car seats and see what happened because sometimes you you just can't replicate actual human anatomy wow fun um and then there's also some talk about like burial and funerary practices so um the book definitely does talk about like medical stuff and anatomical stuff so if you are squeamish about that kind of thing again this would be a book that I would suggest you give a miss um but I find it all fascinating Mm -hmm. um and I learned a ton she has a a lot of different books that I think have a lot of crossover appeal to Mm -hmm. People that typically don't read nonfiction. Yeah. So she does like deep dives into a topic. Yeah, mm-hmm. very specific. And then like kind of explores yeah. all the facets of mm-hmm. that one as that one topic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mary Roach has been on my radar for a long time. Yeah. So does she talk about the body form in She does. Yeah. <laughs> she does talk about the body form. So um The body farm, for those of you who are not in the know, Claire is looking at me like, please stop talking, (laughs) Um, (laughs) is a place, I want to say in Tennessee. Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville. It's where Um, I went to school. (laughs) Okay. Where um, they do research, basically, um, like, forensic and forensic anthropology research. So they take cadavers and they place them in a variety of conditions, Um, maybe buried in a shallow grave, maybe, um, I don't know, laying on top of the ground, but with clothes on or on top of the ground without clothes on. And they just see what happens. So they can check in on these bodies throughout the process of decomposition and see what exactly happens physically, like what um, animal life is present um, at different stages. So that then when Um, forensic scientists have to investigate remains out in the wild as it were they have kind of like control information right they have better parameters in which to infer what happened exactly okay yeah so So, did you go to university of tennessee i did oh well (laughs) and they we we, we couldn't get on the body farm it wasn't allowed but all Mm -hmm. of the undergraduates were like you mean they have better bodies on campus? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, she does actually go and get a tour of the body farm. I'm jealous. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, might, you might not be super jealous after reading that portion of it. Um, I, I think it's perfect to have somebody else go and tell you all about it. So you get the information without necessarily all of the firsthand experience. But that's me. (laughs) So, yeah, um, Stiff by Mary Roach. 
highly recommend. Um, it was very interesting and very funny in a lot of it. There's a lot of humor interjected in there to kind of lighten the subject matter a little bit. So. I think I want to read the one about the animals. Like Fuzz. In cr- yes, animals committing crimes. <laughs> That's more my speed. <laughs> it's, just, it's a little more... <laughs> A little more up Claire's alley. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Lydia. It was so much fun to have you with us today. Thank you for having me on. All your books sounded really good, too. Yeah, Yeah. yours, too. This is the best worst part about Book Break is afterwards adding all of the books that everyone else talked to to your TBR. Yeah. (laughs) So... Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. So thank much. you. Um, and Claire and I will be back in the beginning of November uh, for nonfiction November. That's right. We're going to have a theme. We are going to have a theme, and I'm very excited about that when I have a whole list. Yeah, I think I've already going. got mine all set. Excellent. Yeah good times. But as always, if you have read any of the books that we talked about today, please let us know. Um, Let us know what you thought about them. And if you have suggestions for any of us, let us know that too. We always want your opinions. Yes. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much. And we will see you next time. Book Break is a production of the Grease Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Grease Public Library. Theme music composed and performed 